Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are all delighted to be here. And this next panel is going to focus on the power of genomics to advance the global health agenda. Um, at the Institute for Genome Sciences that we are all have various affiliations with, um, one of our real research strengths is in, is in applying the tools of genomics to the study of infectious agents. And you know, when you say genomics to people, very often the, the first response that you will get is, oh yes, the Human Genome Project. But what I don't think people realize or remember is that m many of the early successes in applying genomics to the study of important biological questions came in applying these technologies to various microbial agents with a very strong emphasis on human and animal pathogens. And um, there was great promise of genomics, and I think it really has delivered in the field of infectious disease and global health to um, provide us with new diagnostics, the ability to do outbreak tracking, new vaccines, new drug targets, and you are going to hear about some of these successes in the work that's underway here at the School of Medicine today. And so the people who are going to give you some of these really exciting stories are to my immediate left, Dr. Jacques Revel, who's a professor in the Department of Microbiology and an associate director at IGS. Dr. David Rasco, who's also a professor of microbiology in IGS. And finally, Dr. <coughs> Shannon Tackle Harrison, who's an associate professor of medicine and a member of the Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health but also um, a long-term collaborator with other faculty at IGS. And so without any further ado, let me, let me turn the um, microphone over to Jacques to give you some um, really exciting examples of how we th we'd like to think we're moving global health forward. Well, thank you very much, Claire, and thank you for, for inviting me to, uh, to, to share uh, some of the, uh, uh, the project that, that we have. So, um, in, in the theme of, of global health, I thought that uh, I could share with you uh, a project uh, that we uh, rec recently launched. Um, it's, a, it's a project that's been funded by uh, the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, uh, I, my laboratory studies uh, the, the microbiome as it relates to women's health. And one of the, the major theme that we, we, are, we, we're looking at is uh, prematurity. Prematurity is a, is a major global health problem. And it's literally global because I think that maturity is just as much of a problem in Western country as it is in, in other low and medium income countries. So there's definitely a need for a, a global approach to trying to understand uh, prematurity. So this project is funded by the, the, the Gates Foundation, and um, which started by creating what they call, because one of the, 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 the site that we're studying is obviously the, the vagina. The urogenital tract is very important and is really uh, has been shown to play a role in, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in pre prematurity. So they started a, a, a consortium, which they, they called the Vaginal Microbiome Research Consortium. That's a consortium that started uh, about a year ago, and it involves university from uh, uh, people from uh, Stanford University, Harvard University, uh, Harvard University, and now the, and the University of Maryland. And we are the, the, the leading PI on, on this project. And I think it's mostly because of our um, expertise in uh, the human microbiome. I think Claire, you know, when we were at Tiger and we started really uh, studying the human microbiome and we brought this here, and now I think our reputation has is, is been following us uh, um, and the Gates Foundation has recognized that. So the, the Vaginal Microbiome Research Consortium has started to study prematurity uh, uh, in the first, in the phase one was uh, in America. Uh, but we're just about to embark in phase two of this project, which we're very excited about because now we've learned a lot of important information from this um, kind of Western phase of the, of the project. But now we're embarking in collaboration with uh, 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 the University of Zambia and uh, ICDDRB in Bangladesh. Um, they uh, receive funding through GAPS, through the, the Bale and Melody Gates Foundation as well, and they've established uh, two amazing cohorts of pregnant women which have been followed over time 
uh, uh, throughout pregnancy and post-pregnancy. So they have this amazing resources that they've, uh, they've established to try to understand a little bit the, the root cause of prematurity. And here, um, we now are forming a, an amazing collaboration to uh, bring in the, the genomic, the modern state-of-the-art technology, what we call system biology approach, to studying uh, prematurity uh, now both in, in Africa, in uh, South Asia, and, and America. So, um, and I think that one of the, the most important thing in, in establishing this, this kind of collaboration, I feel like uh, the success of, of this project, and I think why I think the, the Gates Foundation is, is gone uh, with us to, to do this, is uh, the ability to uh, empower um, the, the, our collaborator to work with us. And uh, it's a true collaboration. So we've, we've dedicated uh, funding for capacity building in, in those uh, universities. And I think this is, this is a critical point uh, that um, needs to be really emphasized, um, that uh, we, we work, by working outside of America, we need to work with those people. They're not just providing samples, they're not, you know, th this become a true collaboration. And to do this, you need to empower them. So you can, you need, you need to build capacity. But the other thing that we, we also doing, it's empowering the local PI and staff. And we're empowering them by providing training. And uh, those people are gonna be coming uh, to Maryland. They're gonna be coming to Harvard and Stanford to receive laboratory and informatic training. And I think this is, this is another uh, very important thing. IGS is also, uh, has a, a very good, a really good reputation in, in informatic and bioinformatics. And we've developed um, tools that allows people anywhere in the world to use uh, those tools. And this is through the power of the cloud. And now you can have people uh, in Africa, in South Asia, anywhere in the world using our tools, uh, using big data without having a server, a big computer, large storage capacity in Africa or in South Asia. And I think that's something that is really empowering for, for people because they learn how to do things uh, without having the need to big infrastructure building, which can be very challenging in some uh, part of those countries. So that's uh, uh, one very uh, important thing. And the last thing, I think that um, in, just like with any collaboration, um, we, as we started this project, we, we established something that uh, we call a publications charter. And um, a lot of time when you work with clinician or something, you tend to forget that clinicians play a major role. And whether they are in America or in Zambia or in Bangladesh, their, their contribution is, is, is just as important as anybody else. And so we have a, a publication charter that every partner sign that's gonna empower um, a local PI and young and junior investigator to be able to lead uh, publication uh, that's gonna uh, result of those projects. And I think that's, that's something we, we don't think about enough, and I think that's something that can empower those studies and you know, help further the collaboration. So maybe I can stop there and get more time to Dave. Um, so I'm Dave Rasko, and again, thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk today. So my lab focuses primarily on diarrheal diseases, but uh, we do extend into a lot of different areas. Uh, one of the reasons I essentially came to the University of Maryland was the fact that the CBD was here and um, adding genomics on top of the excellent work that was going on at the CBD and the ability to um, reach into to, um, some underrepresented countries and, and look at some of the uh, samples that were coming from there uh, really provided an opportunity to, to see what was going on globally. We have a, a good idea from a diarrheal disease standpoint what goes on in, in, in North America and Western countries, but reaching into um, uh, underrepresented nations is uh, really important. Um, in fact, that that's where uh, things uh, tend to be coming from or evolving or changing and places where uh, things like the vaccines can, can make the biggest impact. Um, so just unlike Chuck, I'm gonna tell two little vignettes instead of one, um, just because I have to add one more than Chuck. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the first one is we work on enterotoxigenic E. coli, which is one type of E. coli that uh, was identified in the GEM study as one of the top four diarrheal pathogens um, throughout the seven sites within the, in the GEM study. 
And I started working on enterotoxigenic E. coli essentially when I started my lab here at Maryland um, 11 years ago next week. Um, so it's been a while. Nobody was looking at enterotoxigenic E. coli at that point. The military was very interested. Um, and we really took a, a genomic approach. And we started in ICDERB in, in Bangladesh, um, as well as reaching into South America, into both Brazil and Chile to, to get isolates. Uh, as, as Jacques mentioned, one of the great things about working with all of these sites is bringing people here with us. So we're not just looking at the samples in isolation uh, without involving the investigators there. So uh, from both Chile and Brazil, um, as well as Bangladesh, we've had people visit our lab, <coughs> learn our technology, and as Jacques pointed out, they can log on from any computer onto our servers and look at their own data. So it's not just us looking at what's going on. So actually being able to bring them uh, kind of into the fold and, and into the world of genomics has been great. Um, I was down in Chile uh, last year, and one of their, the, the very exciting things that's happening there is they're no longer sending us um, isolates to sequence. They're doing all of their own sequencing in-house. So that technology has truly moved from um, them coming here to learn to they're now taking it within their own country and distributing it, distributing it, distributing it uh, throughout the, the healthcare system there. And so um, from a genomic standpoint, the, the great thing that we're looking at is all of this diversity that was really um, not captured previously. So PCR tests um, or culture or simple serology uh, would give you certain aspects of what was going on, but genomics gives you that, that whole picture of the pathogen. Um, and so uh, that's, it, it's been really interesting to see how much more diversity is there than people have talked about for, for decades, especially with enterotoxigenic E. coli. Um, we thought it was big, and it was much bigger than we, we uh, originally thought. So that's been a great example of us starting with a kind of a small project here and expanding that and, and moving that out globally. Um, and then the other project that, that I just wanted to mention was one that we've recently just got funded. Um, Claire is, is also one of the, the co-PIs on that. So that's the Genome Center for Infectious Diseases. And we're very interested in that project about polymicrobial infections. We're taking advantage of some of the GEMS um, samples. And I think you're going to talk about some GK projects as well. OK. Um, so I won't touch on it much. Um, but within that, we built into our, our, our administrative core to actually bring investigators um, to IGS for training for multiple months and again to, to kind of uh, have that uh, information transfer back to their home countries. Um, and that is not just bacterial, there's also a fungal project involved uh, as well as a, a eukaryotic pathogens project. So um, it, 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 be, it goes beyond just bacterial genome sequencing into larger eukaryotes. Um, every one of those uh, projects has uh, multiple international collaborators, so we are reaching out um, essentially across the world on multiple different levels. Um, uh, the only level we don't have is viruses, but we're, we're still working on that. We're going to get that at one day. So um, I'll stop there and uh, just kind of give you a taste of what we've been doing and how we've been transferring our knowledge. And, uh, uh, Thank you. Can you all hear me all right? Great, thanks. So I'm representing a group of investigators from the Center for Vaccine Development Malaria Research Program and uh, our longtime collaborators in the Institute for Genome Sciences. We have worked closely with uh, Dr. Joanna Silva uh, since IGS came to University of Maryland on questions uh, related to antimalarial drug resistance and vaccine development. More recently, we've also been collaborating with uh, Dr. David Sayre and also um, Tim O'Connor. Um, our ongoing projects involve, as I said, understanding the genetic basis of antimalarial drug resistance, uh, the impact of antigenic variation on vaccine escape, uh, severe malaria, pathogenesis, um, host parasite, interactions and um, the impact of impact of comorbid infections on uh, clinical outcomes as mentioned as part of the the, the GKID projects. We have funding uh, from both federal and private sources and we've worked with a number of international uh, collaborator collaborators and including our longtime collaborators at the Malaria <coughs> Research and Training Center, the University of Sciences Techniques and Technologies of Bamako and Mali, um, the 
College of Medicine in, in Malawi, in Blantyre, as uh, we all met Dr. Matenga uh, this morning, and also uh, investigators at the Armed Forces Research Institute of Medical Sciences, who we've been working with in the greater Mekong on antimalarial uh, drug resistance questions. Just to reiterate uh, some of the points made by the other panelists, I think a major um, component of the success of these collaborations is uh, that we try to have these collaborations be prospective in nature. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. So we, we want these collaborations to be prospective in nature. Again, uh, echoing what Jacques said about um, involving uh, endemic country investigators at all phases of the research and not just um, treating them as, as sample providers. Um, and capacity building, again, is a, a key component of our research collaborations. As Jacques mentioned, computing capacity is becoming increasingly available to um, investigators in the developing world and our goal is to help provide training to these investigators so that uh, they can develop skills in managing and analyzing uh, these large omics data sets um, and can use the data generated as part of these collaborations to answer additional questions that are of interest uh, to the research programs. I think also um, it's very powerful to combine all of these investigators from dis different, different, different disciplines. Uh, the genomics and bioinformatics expertise, the clinical and epidemiological expertise, and the knowledge of the policy and translational implications. If you combine all of these areas of expertise, I think you end up with a much more impactful research product. Um, for example, as part of some of our work on antimalarial drug resistance, we worked with IGS investigators to use genomic data to type drug resistant malaria paras drug resistant malaria parasites to understand their origins. Now, with the emergence of artemisinin resistance in Southeast Asia, the World Health Organization's big fear was that this resistance would spread from its original focus in Western Cambodia to other areas of the malaria endemic world, including Africa. And the fear was, you know, we, we need to prevent spread of artemisinin-resistant parasites westward. Well, as part of our work with the IGS team in, in uh, using these genomics to fingerprint these drug-resistant parasites, we were able to show that the artemisinin-resistant parasites in Myanmar did not spread from Cambodia. They emerged independently there. So this uh, had implications for uh, policy in that we shared these findings with uh, officials at the World Health Organization who then decided because drug resistance was emerging independently and not necessarily spreading uh, from Cambodia, that the policy decision then was to try to eliminate malaria completely from the greater Mekong subregion rather than try to set up focal containment you know, at the border of Cambodia. So that's just one example of how powerful it can be to combine uh, all of this expertise from, from investigators from various disciplines and, and countries. So. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, you, you heard a bit about these ongoing funded projects, but I'm, I'm going to put Dave Rasco on the spot. Um, and ask if he could speak ever so briefly uh, to the power of genomics to have an impact 
during in infectious disease outbreaks, unexpected outbreaks. Um, Dave was involved in a study of an E. coli outbreak a number of years ago, and some of you in the audience may be familiar with what can be done, others may not. I think it just would be helpful to talk about what genomics can do outside of these multi-year funded projects, because I think it's, it's been shown to have um, a very big impact. So if you don't mind, Dave. Sure. Um, so there was, in 2011, there was an outbreak that uh, kind of happened centered around uh, Germany. It was an unusual kind of E. coli, and that was an 0104, so that's the serotype, but it was shared toxin positive, which really hadn't been seen before. Um, the number of cases ended up being almost 4,000 people ended up in the hospital, and with diarrheal disease, you usually have to kind of double the number of people who were actually impacted um, in the range of uh, 800 people that ended up uh, with hemolytic syndrome, which is a severe uh, kidney implication, and uh, just over 50 people that died in that outbreak. So from a death standpoint, it's one of the largest um, E. coli outbreaks um, in, in history that we know about. Um, but it was uh, a, a really a unique E. coli isolate that we hadn't seen before. We happen to be sequencing a lot of E. coli kind of what we do. Um, and one of our collaborators in Denmark who got one of these isolates gave me a call one day and said, hey, would you like to look at these isolates? Uh, we partnered with Pacific Biosciences, who was a new technology at that point. Um, most of the sequencing technology at that point had gone to small reads. Pacific Biosciences was long reads. Um, gave us a, a much better appreciation of what the genome looked like. But within days, um, instead of years, we were looking at the genomes of these isolates that were coming out of people in Europe. Uh, we had the infrastructure in place here to compare those rapidly to worldwide isolates that we had. Um, and we could quickly identify uh, what it was most similar to and what it its most likely origins were. Um, we could give uh, that overview, but it really went back to hardcore epidemiology that actually traced the outbreak to a collection of sprout seeds um, that came out of, uh, <coughs> out of Egypt, uh, were grown in, in Germany, and then uh, were distributed across Germany. It was a very odd isolate in the fact that it was killing people, which was rare. And not just that it was killing people, but it was killing people um, of a healthy age, so between 25 and 40. Usually when you have shaken toxin positive strain, it, it really impacts the young, so the kids under five um, or the elderly. Um, so it was a really odd distribution. We got the genomes very rapidly, and in the span of less, than, less time than the actual outbreak took, we had sequenced a dozen isolates, compared them with the four other isolates that were done um, elsewhere around the world, um, and placed this, all of this knowledge kind of into context. So, we knew what it looked like, what it was most similar to, and what its antimicrobial resistances were from just that genome sequencing. Um, we did that just to put it into perspective. Those genomes were sequenced in less than 24 hours each. So if you think about a clinical time frame uh, in, in terms of identifying organisms, um, we were really on, on par with that clinical time frame. That was also eight years ago. Now the technology has advanced even further that I'm going to borrow Shock's phone as a, just a prop. Um, the the min ion sequencer is about this big, and you can plug it into your phone. So you don't need, uh, you don't need IGS anymore. Um, <laughs> although you still need it. Uh, but the infrastructure, uh, the, a huge, we don't need a huge infrastructure to actually generate genome sequence anymore. Um, the Oxford Nanopore technology, like I said, it plugs into your phone. Um, all of the data gets directly uploaded to the cloud, and all of the analysis can happen on that cloud. So uh, porting that information on how to do that data analysis from a place like IGS um, to anywhere in the world, that allows anybody to do genomics essentially on their phone. Um, I think it, it will change how we do at least some infectious disease around the world. Thank you. And I just, yeah, I just want to mention, you, you heard from our um, three panelists here about the idea of capacity building and about including collaborators from around the world and, and the power that can come from having access to all of these different large data sets. And I just want to say that um, it has been um, a very high priority for IGS investigators to make sure that 
we do what we can, not only through these collaborations, but um, for anybody who is interested to, to help train, particularly in terms of the data analysis, which is where the real power comes from. So if any of you are interested, IGS runs four or five <coughs> workshops each year. They are open to anybody. We have had many international students attend, and these are, these, these attendees can be first year graduate students all the way through to senior investigators, and these are three or four day courses where you come and it's a hands-on experience to really learn how to download these data, how to manipulate them, how to run various pipelines so that you can be more empowered to do some of the things that you heard about today. Um, it looks like we have a few minutes left, and so I just thought since maybe we might take advantage of that time and ask if there are any questions from anyone in the audience. questions? Okay, well, thank you all for your attention and um, hopefully we were able to communicate to you some of the exciting work that's going on and um, the, uh, the ways in which that is uh, impacting overall global health. So, thank you. Thank you.